Okay, we're going to go ahead and start. My name is Greg Hyde with JMS Biohandling Product Manager. Today we'll be talking about key design considerations for conveyance and storage systems. The pace of this presentation may be a bit fast, but it will be available on our website for review. Also, if you've got any questions, please type them and your name into the chat bar and we will get back to you. The most commonly used conveyor types in wastewater treatment are shafted screw, shaftless screw, and belt conveyors, including troughing and sidewall belts. The product we're conveying is a key factor in selecting the conveyor type. This is a matrix of typical wastewater treatment products and conveyor recommendations by conveyor types. You can see all conveyors handle dewatered sludge well, while shafted or even drag chains are best suited for dried biosolids or dry lime. A pushing drive shaftless is recommended for screenings to prevent ragging. Screws are used for underwater grit apps and all types of conveyors handle dewatered grit well. Uh, all things being equal, sometimes it comes down to um, owner preference. It also comes down to some strength and weaknesses of each conveyor type. After product conveyed, all of these design related variables may affect the type of conveyor selected. Upstream process, feed type downstream process, site layout, distance to be conveyed, elevation gain, owner preference, materials of construction, the environment, and the system goals. After the conveyor type selection, volumetric flow, flow rate is the starting point of sizing the conveyor. I just wanted to say a word on regarding volumetric flow and sludge. We're often given designed load in dry pounds per hour coming from a dewatering device. This is fine, but we must have a percent dry solids and density, density to arrive at a volumetric flow. As you can see by these examples that have the same dry pounds per hour, but different percent dry solids and density knowing these numbers are important to your conveyor design. Use the lowest expected percent dry solids and density, which result in a higher volume to use as a safety factor. Let's look at a quick look at shafted versus shaftless. The shaftless spiral is supported by UHMWPE liners on the trough bottom. The liners are the wear item. No central shaft allows for higher filling rates and slower RPMs, which limit the liner wear. Shafted flights are suspended above the trough by end and hanger bearings. The bearings are the wear item. A central shaft limits the fill rate, but a shafted conveyor may use or run at higher RPMs. Shaftless fill rates can be up to 100%, but as shown here on the left in the diagram at 50%, but typically in wastewater treatment apps, we design at 35 to 45% fill rate for shaftless screws. Shaftless for screenings are usually oversized for the large objects, so that results in a lower fill rate. Shafted fill rates are between 15 and 30 percent to keep the sludge below the shaft and hanger bearings. The variable between the 15 and 30 percent depends on screw diameter, pipe OD, and or the flange OD for connecting uh, the, the shaft to hanger bearings and drives. 
and you can see here are all the variables that we need to decide on. Uh, these are all inputs into our horsepower calcs. So that's all data that we need to get get to the, uh, the horsepower. Here's a uh, typical simple layout. This shows a shaftless pushing drive pushing directly into the connecting of a pulling drive conveyor. This is achieved only with a shaftless since the non-drive end doesn't require a shaft. This is good for apps requiring low inlet point. The feeding equipment dimensional information is a key layout starting point. You can see the end-to-end -end connection here. Not possible with a shafted screw. A typical shafted screw is going to have a gravity drop go over the top of the one conveyor into the, into the other. It's actually preferred to do that on a shaftless too, if you have the elevation to do that. This system loads bins evenly and automatically with multiple slide gates, ultrasonic sensors, and control logic. Hanging systems require structural considerations. These yellow beams were specific to the conveyor support. JMS bio gates are key to our distribution conveyors and hoppers. They use stainless steel rollers, blade, and frame construction with UHMWPE guides and neoprene seals. Electric multi-turn multi actuators are standard and recommended. However, we do also utilize pneumatics and hydraulics. Pivoting conveyors accept sludge at the pivot point and rotate to distribute into bins or trucks. They're automated with drives and sensors to fill multiple containers. It's a good option for small to medium sized plants. Here we're using an inclined shaftless to push startup slot from the centrifuge to a drain during startup. When the centrifuge starts to produce cake, the conveyor pulls the sludge to the downstream conveyors. This eliminates the need for a centrifuge drain gate. It's a good application for a shaftless screw in the sludge application. Truck loadout conveyors are on the second floor and show how integral the st structural design and the conveyor supports need to be. Early building design should include conveyor design. Belt conveyors are as flexible as screw conveyors, including pivoting systems. Belts are ideal for long, high volume designs. The material sits static on the moving belt and is not exposed to shearing action like screw conveyors. Screw conveyors, uh, if you've got class A sludge that uh, has a value uh, and you go through uh, a lot of distance and incline, the screw conveyors are going to uh, change the property of that sludge and make it a, into a gloppy consistency and not desired for uh, class A product. So belt conveyors are used pretty extensively moving class A product. We have a troughing and a sidewall design. Troughing is probably 75% of the wastewater treatment belt apps. It can transition from this troughing profile to flat carry idlers uh, where we need to utilize plows to have multiple drop points. A sidewall belt is a flat belt with corrugated walls that hold product as a belt changes direction. The outer belt tangent here
is used to hold the belt down at transition from horizontal to incline by hold down wheels or what they call a knuckle situation, but uh, that's not shown here. Sidewall belts can be multiple plane, horizontal, incline to horizontal with one drive. They're usually used in tight layouts and smaller volume applications. Here's a typical simple run. Same thing you could do with the screw conveyor. This is a troughing belt conveyor, point A to point B. Uh, again, we need dimensional information to assist with design, discharge point, or inlet points and discharge points. A troughing belt can change directions, similar to a sidewall, but it has to be at a very gentle curve. This curve here has to be a minimum 150 foot radius or else the belt will begin to lift off of the, since the belt is uh, tightened under tension, the belt can lift off of the carry idlers if it's not that 150 foot radius. This is a 200 foot plus system for Dallas, Texas, carrying dewatered sludge up to a uh, truck loadout, hoppers and a truck loadout. Here's a troughing system that goes from troughing to flat belt to utilize 11 plows to load three truck bays. It's ideal to get, uh, if there's a specific truck size, to design for that. But with controls, we can design for a maximum and be pretty flexible on the truck, truck uh, loadout size. Here's a sidewall belt with multiple planes. We're going from horizontal to incline, back from horizontal. This had to uh, change pretty quickly between this dewatering device and this truck lane. Possibly could have used a radial curve in here, but it would have been a little bit tight. So a sidewall was a good solution for that. We can go up to 25 degrees incline on belts without using cleats. We prefer not to use cleats just because the uh, you can't use a scraper with a with cleated belt and that limits how clean you can get the um, get the belt. Let's take a quick look at bifurcated chutes. These are a pants leg type chute with a flap valve in the middle, typically with a uh, quarter turn actuator, electric actuator. It's on the other side of this when you can't see it. Uh, you've got a shaft through here and a flap valve so you can divert uh, sludge or product from one point to the other. You can use this as a bypass or um, emergency chute. Now we're getting into hopper design or silo design for definition purposes. We're calling silos any cylindrical storage, hoppers or square rectangular storage, bins are uh, square or rectangular but open or retractable tops. And the key design criteria for hoppers is very much the same as conveyors but the volumetric capacity replaces volumetric, volumetric flow. So we want to know what is the target usable volume in cubic yards. Also height restrictions, feed points, and downstream process carry more of an importance in storage solutions. I'm going to take a quick look at uh, two different storage solutions for comparison. Side by side, on the left is a wet sludge storage hopper for Allen, Texas, 450 cubic yard usable space. On the right, dry silo for Atlanta, 421 cubic yard usable. Uh, you can see the difference in the height. Um, 
course, our retractable chute over here on the dry side takes up uh, a fair amount of uh, the elevation here. I think this is up to about 21 feet. Typical truck drive through for a for clearance on a truck drive through for a wet storage wet sludge storage hopper is 14 feet. So um, neither one of these had height restrictions. You can also see how we have to look at the feed points. This had multiple feed points to best utilize the storage area. If this had one feed point only, with your angle of repose, uh, a good portion of this hopper would have been air and not an efficient use of, I believe in this case, 316 stainless steel. And a, a similar uh, common factor is that most of these two storage vessels get most of their usable storage space from the straight wall side. The cone in the bottom, the angle of repose at the top, represents a smaller portion or ratio. Once we can get to that straight wall storage area, then we really gain the, the uh, volume, usable volume. You can see that the slopes are both at 60 degrees minimum. We don't want to go any less than 60 degrees off horizontal um, just for flow of product, both in wet and dry side. Uh, we try to limit the live bottom screws to 30 feet or less, and that's uh, a different webinar altogether. We could get into uh, a lot of details on the live bottom screws, but we're going to stay away from that, that level right now. But I just wanted to let you see uh, the geometry involved in, in, in some of these designs. For silos on the dry bile solid size, we use silos uh, exclusively for dry bile solids just because it's a nice flowable product. Uh, another key consideration for dry bile solids uh, specific to this is the finding the sludge KST and Pmax value. This is the uh, tested value that tells the rate of uh, explosive values of the sludge. Uh, it's usually in the 150 to 200 KST range. Um, and it uh, it's considered a combustible material and in a confined space, which the storage vessel is, it needs to meet NFPA codes for that. That's National Fire Prevention Association. Uh, we use nitrogen purge or blanket systems, thermal couples for temp sensing, carbon monoxide and oxygen sensors, dust control uh, on the silo and the retractable chutes. You can see here. This is uh, this is actually a model for City of Atlanta. This has a side loading because of site site restrictions on where the truck could come in. The one for Savannah was a truck drive-through system. The silos for wet sludge. Um, we do both. Uh, large large diameter is going to be a site bolted construction. Small to medium tanks are going to be can be shop welded up to 14 feet depending on shipping locations and we prefer to go with the chisel cone design which goes from round to rectangular uh, live bottoms. This is a job we're installing right now at, uh, I believe it just has installed at Palo Alto, three uh, separate wet sludge silos with the chisel cone design. Hoppers for wet sludge. We have two different types of hoppers for wet sludge. We have gravity drop to trucks 
and then we have a metered hopper to pump process. This is the truck loading uh, system. This is the model for Allen, Texas, which is being installed right now. You'll, it will have multiple slide gates, heavy duty slide gates. Uh, sometimes these slide gates are three by four feet under the live bottom screws to load the trucks. Again, uh, one this size, this is about 450 cubic yards each. These had to be fill welded. These are fit together in our shop, then dismantled for shipping purposes. We have done some small enough to be truckable in one or two pieces uh, for site fill bolting together. Here is a couple of examples for a metered sludge for wet sludge hoppers. Uh, this is one of four we did for Washington, D.C. for the Canby system there. Sludge is metered out and dropped into uh, PC pumps that take it to, this is pre-THP process. This is metered out, sent to the THP process. This is uh, one of two uh, multiple split bottom hoppers for Dallas. That's also THP process, pre-THP. And you can see the, um, the, the pump layout matters here and what they're planning to do with the pumps. Uh, we, we need to get in uh, pretty early on design on that. Also, there is a, um, uh, because we've got the screw feeding the pump here that needs to maintain some positive pressure on that pump as far as getting sludge to it. Any uh, maintenance slide gate in, in between here has to be a knife gate rated for pressure in the open and closed direction. And we'll look at some receivable bins. Uh, we also do some small bins, uh, what we call day bins for grit and screenings with just a simple slide gate on the bottom. These are low volume uh, applications, low volume hoppers could be anywhere from one to 10 cubic yards. The Wet sludge receival hoppers, uh, typically bringing in foreign sludge to a plant for further process like either THP or incineration or drying. Uh, these hold anywhere from 15 to 30 cubic yards. Uh, you can see that um, sometimes we have height restrictions on hoppers, sometimes we have uh, pit restrictions. Uh, how deep can we go? Uh, when we will typically go four wide on the live bottom screws here, and that's just to get a wide cross sectional area so that we can have a, um, a good volume in this uh, back spot of the, the hopper so that the uh, instantaneous load from the truck won't overflow the hopper. We also use leveling screws to pull this away from the back of the hopper and empty these in a given amount of time. Uh, usually that is one of the design criteria is how quickly do we need to empty that receivable bin for the next load. So in summary, we have um, key design takeaways or product volumetric flow or storage capacity, upstream and downstream process, elevations and or height restrictions, design intent and scope of supply, and please involve conveyor, conveyor design early in the plant design for the best system and layout result. Thank you. If you came in late, uh, this will be posted on our website. Uh, later today, probably. And if you've got any questions, just send those in through uh, my email address or the website address, and we will get back to you. Thank you for your time.